The Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. Can we make an agreement to not talk about the game? I know that's weird. It's the post-game pod. And I'm saying let's not talk about the game. Post the game. But I don't really want to talk about the game. Game 80. The Celtics clearly not bringing the motivation this week. Celtics fall to the New York Knicks, 118, 109. Wasn't as close as that even suggests. Stay ready group helped dent that, that lead. All right, I guess I'm giving a quick synopsis of the game here. You probably already know. Why am I wasting the time? I want to talk about something else. You'll hear some talk about the game from our post-game crew, but we have to do it. It's part of the pod, right? Like, can't just ignore it completely, but I'm going to try. Can we talk about Derek White? That's more fun topic. A couple things. Derek White gets the Red Auerbach Award for, uh, for the 2023-24 season. Uh, award given annually to the Celtic that best embodies what it means to be a Celtic, both on and off the court. And uh, let's face it, most of the core, Jalen, Jason, have won the award. A couple new faces that could have got it with Drew and Kristaps and Derek. But Derek rewarded for how good he's been this year, the way he's evolved in this larger role, how he played to an all-star level for much of the first half, for being the NBA leader in net rating, for all he's done off the court, for the way he's just embraced being a key part of the team with the best record in basketball. So let's talk about Derek White's future because that's the big spent a little bit of yesterday's pod talking about the Drew Holiday extension and the natural question and the one I heard the most over the last 24 hours is, so what happens with Derek White? People are very concerned that in splurging to keep Drew Holiday deep into the future and with the Jays' super maxes set to kick in over the next two years, that there might not be enough resources to keep Derek here. And we all know how vital... Derek is to the success of this team. I just told you, you got an award for it. So I'm here to tell you that Celtics can offer a four-year contract at $122 million, up to $122 million, this summer with hopes of retaining Derek White deep into the future. Will he take it? Well, I can't tell you for certain because I don't know. I do think there's Derek has played well enough that should he play to the same level next year or even better than what we saw this year, if that stat line continues to grow and blossom, that there would certainly be teams out there that would be willing to, to pay big money for his services. But I also know that there's a luxury, much like Drew Holiday showed us, in even if you're not making Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum money, being a well-compensated piece of the puzzle, a piece of a championship puzzle. And so I think Derek's at the luxury here where he doesn't have to really even think about it until we get past the postseason. And, you know, you win a title, maybe you feel a certain way. You don't win a title, maybe you feel a different way. Uh, There's plenty of time to process the emotions of what will happen. What I can tell you is that I had to sit down with Derek this morning for another project. And uh, I said, you know, I, I just got to bring it up. It's what everyone keeps asking me. Just, I'm not asking if you're going to sign an extension this offseason, but, you know, we all know what the number could be. And what do, you, what do you want from your future? What do you envision from your future? And he very diplomatically said that, you know, they talked this year. There wasn't a whole lot of urgency to that process. They're going to talk again. This summer, Derek noted that getting traded to Boston was maybe the best thing that's ever happened to him. Not only did it allow him to join an organization that was playing to a high level, but brought out his best basketball, allowed him to blossom in that role. And he stressed that he's really happy here. So you'll hear that whole interview probably next week during the break between the end of the regular season and the playoffs. Um, 
but yeah, I think I can confidently say that that Derek in, enjoys his role here. That uh, Derek is very aware of what the situation is, and so you know, look, I don't begrudge anybody that wants to to get the best possible payday, and I think he'll just have to balance that: the risk of injury, the risk of you know, do you take that money but be a number one, number two focal point of a team? Um, Derek is super important to what happens here, but they'll always be the Jays to sort of be the the focal points. And so that, that's, that can be a curse and a blessing. Like sometimes you want that spotlight. Sometimes it's okay to be just a, a, a complimentary piece, someone who accentuates those talents, makes the, the Jays so much better. And so uh, I think what the track record tells us about Brad Stevens and how much he loves extensions – Derek's desire to win and just how much he seems to get it with like how everything works. Um, I think there's a good chance that we get to the summer or before the start of next season. And maybe there's a, a deal to be made there that keeps him here long term, which would, you know, essentially keep him here for five years, playing off the last year of, of his contract and then tacking on four more. Um, from from a Boston standpoint, that's particularly attractive because you've got so much of your core locked up. Presumably you'll get to the finish line with Jason Tatum on a Supermax, five years, $315 million, I believe. Jalen's about to watch his kick in. Obviously Drew Holiday's extension, four years, 135 just went through. Chris Stops has two more seasons at about $30 million each. So regardless of how it all plays out the next couple months, and I think if you're the Celtics, you're hopeful that it plays out well and you're daydreaming about maybe multiple championships or multiple runs, whatever the case may be. But I think uh, there's a there's a uh, a good a good likelihood that Derek White is is a key piece of of how they envision this future unfolding, even if there are tougher decisions to make along the way. And certainly I you know, I, I do have to throw in a caveat like when you think about a potential $200 million starting lineup for that 25-26 season, when the Jays are making over $100 million combined, when Chris Stapps and Drew are accounting for $62 million, and then you had Derek at potentially $30 million. So it's, uh, it's going to be a very costly starting five, and yet if you are the best team in basketball, if you have the continuity that potentially could even grow from just this season – there's a lot of reasons to to think that could happen and to for both sides to want to embrace that. So I just think it's uh Celtics are really in a good spot. You know, they we we we'll save the deeper dive into the bench pieces and you know, it but it bears mentioning like Sam Hauser's going to be up for an extension off his, you know, deal uh you know, as much I think it's 478 was the number that they can go up to. you got to figure out Luke Cornett. Some of these, these complimentary pieces, bench pieces that have been pretty good this year and have given you a little bit off the bench. Um, you do have Peyton Pritchard already locked up. So top seven-ish, probably really stable going into next year. Uh, like I said, there'll be plenty of time to assess what happens from there. But for everyone who just keeps saying, all right, what does this mean for Derek White? Hope I've, I've, I've made you feel a little bit more at peace about it. Uh, I think both sides are, are pretty aware of, of the potential here. And we'll let the Celtics try to try to make it an even bigger sell by bringing home a, a banner in June. And then, then you cross that bridge. But uh, Derek White, super important to this all and that Red Auerbach trophy. Uh, let me just say this game pinnacled with him receiving that before the tip-off. All right, begrudgingly, here's more on the game from our post-game show. Welcome to the Celtics Post Game Live. Tom Giles, Eddie House, Cal. Yep, the Celtics fall into this one, uh, 118 to 109, the final score in a game that it was a 30 plus point game there in, in, into the third quarter. But that last group at the end, fighting hard. Peyton job, Pritchard, yeah. of course, you know, yeah. filling it up as he always does. Give him credit. Yeah, competing. We're, we're gonna give we're gonna give that group a ton of credit today because that's what. Joe wanted them to do, come out and fight. They're all fighting for their playoff lives. They're going to get an opportunity to play tomorrow, probably get another opportunity to play on Sunday. So shout out to those guys for doing that. But I said this from the beginning. I'll say it again. 
Knicks are tough. That with them with OG Ananobi, like if we match up, that's going to be a good series. You got to give them guys credit for for this reason. It was hard for the starters to get up for this game, for sure, and and to be out there. And once you get down by it was a thirty point game at yeah. some point. And then they're still able to go out there, compete, play as hard as they were able to play. And we know this, that some of those guys aren't going to be playing in playoff minutes. Peyton Pritchard will be a guy that plays. Sam Hauser will be a guy that plays. Lou Cornette might get some spot minutes, but Sfee's not going to be out there. So when you look at that, you, you also say, man, he's auditioning for 29 other teams for as sure. well. So uh, you got to give them credit for being professionals. What did you guys think of the way that uh, the Celtics tried to defend Jalen Brunson tonight? He went off for 39 points. And, of course, did all that in basically three quarters, but went off for 39 points. Do you believe that they defended him the, the way they're going to, or are you kind of no. saving a little bit for if and when you, you see the Knicks in some I, point the I definitely think they're saving some adjustments for him. I don't think that the way that they guarded him. But I don't also think they just let him score. Like, I think that he got to where he wanted to on the floor. He didn't want to show your hand in the pick and roll, like whether you go over or under, but... Jalen Brunson's a problem, man. I'm telling you. I don't know. Like a lot of people said, he's not that dude. He's that dude to me. When I watch him play, he's that dude. Yeah, he plays uh, at his own pace. His tempo is never sped up. He knows where he's going. Like that play right there with, with, against Porzingis is acting like I'm about to go all the way to the basket, gets his feet slide, and pulls up, on, stops on a dime, and pulls up. I mean, and look, at he's scoring against everybody, though. Yeah. And it's not a clip to where it's one guy that's getting all of those buckets. He's scoring against everybody, whether it was Jalen, Jason, uh, Drew Holiday, uh, Porzingis he scored on, whether it was Derek White. He gave everybody some of that bug. And the cold part is he got 39 in, in three quarters. He could have had 50 tonight if he wanted to. If they kept him out there, he could have had 50 points tonight. All right. And as it was, I mean, he had the 39. And he left with his team up by a, a ton. Let's talk about that third quarter. And because at halftime, we're trying to figure it out. What's Joe Mazzulli going to do? How much time are you going to see the starters out there for the third quarter? And they were out there. For most of it, it was, you know, That's nine minutes said, plus. Right? That's right. Scal said I was going to be wrong. I wasn't on that one. Good job, but they were Tom. out. Thank you. Uh, they were out there for nine plus. Well, but They what? might have well not been out there the way they it, it played. It looked like they wasn't on. No, I think they tried. I think the Knicks, so let's, and Eddie, you can agree or disagree with this. When you're in the NBA and you're playing against a team that's playing for something and they have an edge and they're trying to send you a message, and if you just let go of the rope just a little bit, I think I've always said that's a 20-point loss in the NBA. I think the margins are a lot closer than people think. And when you watch that game, I thought the Celtics came out and they said, all right, we're going to try to make a stand. And the Knicks took a few of those and then went to another level. And at that point, I think we kind of waved the white flag. Well, when you do have a team that comes in and has everything to gain, and we, we, we have nothing to gain and really nothing to lose, where the Knicks were, has everything to gain and everything to lose with a game like that, you're going to get their best shot. And either you match or and exceed their, their intensity, their effort, their force, the way that they're playing, or you sit back and you take an L like this. And I don't think that they just gave up, but I, I do think that one team came out playing with a, a more a, – a, more sense of urgency. No question. You know, and a little bit more for force, a little bit more focus. And, you know, what, what, what can you do? You, you, when you don't have anything to play for, it's hard to get up for those games. And, and I understand. And when you're out there, though, you still got to compete. And when you're, not, when, when you're not able to match and you start seeing the game start to slip away, it, it gets a whole lot easier. That rope, ugh, you start letting a lot, let, sure. letting a lot, of, it, a lot of it go. Well, how hard is it? Also, at this point in the year where, you know, you got everything locked up since whenever that New Orleans game was, which feels like it was weeks ago. Uh, but they've had everything locked up. And you come in and you bring it up like New York is trying to lock up the three seed, if not try to catch Milwaukee at that two seed. To then, if you're the Celtics, create the game within the game, create that some sort of stakes that are, that are at hand here tonight. I, I think they could, but I think that the Knicks are too physical of a team. So... It's like this. Like, if you're going and you're like, all right, we're going to send a message, here we go, and you go to drive and you hit a body, and you're like, man, do I really want to deal with this tonight? And I, didn't, I just don't think that they wanted to deal with it tonight. No, I don't think it's disrespectful or anything like that. I just think they looked at the Knicks and the physicality and the edge that they were playing with, and they're like, like let's, just, let's just get through this game. Let's go through the Charlotte, the Washington game, and we'll worry about the playoff. We'll worry about our ramp up later. And you know what I also think that – there's a lot to be learned from this game, and it, it, it doesn't have too much to do with the way that you lost, but it's the way that the Knicks played. 
they're in playoff mode. 100%. So they're doing everything they can to win games. So while we're trying to keep everything tight, close to the vest, and not really tip our hand, and maybe we see – it, this is a good learning experience. You got your, your film. You see Jalen uh, Brunson getting off. You seeing how he's getting off, where he's getting off at. So this is an opportunity to get some tape and look at it and say, okay, the games that we played, these is where this is where he was successful, especially the game where we were just allowing him. Because I don't think we changed much. We had a couple times where we switched. But for the most part, we stayed in that drop coverage mm -hmm. the, the whole game and allowed him to get to his spot and get to his shot. So I think th that you could look at this game and say, okay, there's a lot that we learned. We know we don't want to be in the drop coverage if he's going to his right. We want to be pressed up a little bit more. We don't want to show. We don't have to – because nobody's really showing no more and getting back, right? But our drop can't be so far back. We'll be up a little bit. And then we have to have the weak side pull over a little bit to get to touch the tags and just be, be locked in defense. So I think it's it's a lot of, that you could learn from this game. Even though it was ugly, it wasn't, you know, your best performance, but I still think that you could gather a lot of information and they and they will gather a lot of informa information from this game. And how much do you think they're going to look back at that second quarter in particular? Because, again, this game, it was 44-43. The Knicks had a one-point lead, and then they went on a 17 nothing run somewhere in there. Uh, and it was really that second quarter where they kind of enforced their will. Pretty much everything Eddie just said about the drop coverage and how, like, the adjustments that they need to make on the drop coverage, that was all happening in this. And it also led to a bunch of offensive rebounds when their coverage wasn't solid. Like, guys would come off the body, and then they would end up crashing the glass because of it. So, I know they'll be ready for it if, the, if, if this time comes, but um, they're going to have to be because the Knicks' high pick and roll was a problem. The Knicks' execution today was a problem. Yeah, I, I, and the way that they get Jalen – his shots, you know, it, it's high pick and roll. Now, time it's that angle, high pick and roll at a different angle. So he can go strong hand. They could, you know, set the flat screen for him to come off to his strong hand, or he could come off to his right hand where he could get into a step back. And as a defender, if you're the guy that's in a drop, it's it's you got to hope that they're forcing him to that screen. We've seen a bunch of rejects right there. So I, I felt like it was a lot of knee jerk reactions tonight too. I think a half count slow on your defensive reactions um, that that. Offensive rebound that led to the three in the corner where uh, Derek White was standing straight up. Then he's like, oh, let me get back in. It's those little things, and it's hard to always be locked in, especially 82-game season. You got all this locked up. So you say pl find the game within a game. Well, it's hard to do it when it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yep. Even though every game does matter, and, but it's still hard to find that motiv motivation sometimes. All right, you brought up the offensive rebounds, and again, at, at halftime it was 17-2 to two as far as second-chance points go for the New York Knicks. <laughs> Hey, 12 offensive rebounds in that first half. Um, and this is kind of – it's been a recurring issue a little bit here. Lately. Towards the end. Yes. Lately. Not over the course of the season, but I would say the last – Well, then do you attribute that to I guess, everything yeah. being wrapped up or I just mean, the I, fact that teams are really starting to crash and, and play with that extra effort? Well, we, so I attribute to a few things, right? I think we're playing a lot slower. So when you – play fast, a lot of times when teams crash the boards, you end up getting out and running and getting like 32 fast break points or some absurd number. So I attribute it a little bit to us playing slower. But with the Knicks, that's what they do. Like, that's how they play. They spread you, and I think Eddie talked about the spacing at halftime. They spread you out. They go high pick and roll. They play off of it. They play off two feet. But also, when they get into a situation where the defense has to react to Brunson, they hit the offensive glass. So, to me, this is who the Knicks are. There are ways to counter that. Tonight, we did not counter that. We didn't counter that with a double big lineup that would rebound the ball. And we didn't counter that by getting out and running and forcing them to have three guys back. But if you're going to play the Knicks, get used to the, get used to rebounding or putting a body, especially on Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. It is what it is. No, it's... It's not who we are, obviously. This is not, you know, we, we got booed at the end for a reason, you know. This is not the, the fans, this is not the team that our fans love, you know. This, this wasn't that display, but best believe we're going to show up when, when we need to. And, and uh, we have a week of work now ahead of us and, and a couple games um, to bounce back and, uh, and get, get, get going on all, all cylinders because we know what the goal is. And, and make no mistake about that. Chris, I think from the outside, many fans are worried that you're going to fall into some bad habits, right? People who aren't around the team all the time, they see this, and it's the most recent thing in their mind. 
What can you say to people who are worried about like that this is going to be the way you start the playoffs versus leaning on the stuff that got you to 60 plus points? Maybe we will. Maybe we'll get our ass kicked again one more time, start the series. Who knows? And then we're then it's a wake up call for us. But most likely, if I had to bet, I would say we will show up at the level that we need to show up. Um, but it's 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 uh, it's on us. It's on us. And and um, as I said, I don't think it's um. We it's 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 yeah. I don't I don't think it's a habit for us. You know, it's just to be honest. Once we turned up, they were still making shots. They were still like, man, it was just one of those games for them and one of those games for us, to be honest, even when the intensity was like evened out. So, and usually when, when, when we even out the intensity, we always have the advantage and we start building. But tonight was just wasn't our night on, on you know, on any of those aspects. So uh, that the, we got the result, but the second, second unit was, was on fire, you know, and got us back and, and, and at least gave some like positivity to the crowd at the end of the game. But uh, again, uh, I would say no chance we, 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 we don't turn up as the team that the fans love on the first playoff game. Do you, do you like playing with these high expectations? I do, to be honest. I do, and 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 I love. You know, you always see me like I'm waving at the crowd, like pumping my fist in the air. Like, I just, I, I don't know. I, I love this. Like, uh, I love the passion that the fans have. I love this like pressure on us and playing for this like historic franchise and uh, having these expectations and 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 and, and then being like, and being on this big stage and then seeing if you could bring it. This this is what I really love and really enjoy. So cannot wait for us to to start the postseason. KB, One more, Jared. Drew got his extension today. Just what is the event of this team and how happy are you to see him? Win? Yeah, Drew's the man. Everybody love him in his locker room from day one. Showed up selfless, uh, giving everything everything to the team. Well deserved extension. Um, happy that he's going to be around. For people who aren't around the team all the time and haven't like seen the whole process getting up to this point, there might be a feeling on the outside from some fans that you're falling into bad habits or the past few games are maybe uh, a little bit of a slippage. How do you counter that and how do you kind of like reassure fans that these aren't bad habits, that this is something maybe different? Uh, no, we just, I mean, what I would say is that we just got out tough the last two games. Um, we haven't played to our standard. A turn of physicality. The game has shifted a little bit, and it's going to shift even more in the playoffs. And we ain't meet the whistle for whatever reason. Um, it could be just because of, of anticipation for the playoffs or, or whatever. But um, that's what I'll say. We're going to nip that in the bud, though. Chris Stapps was just saying that if he, had, if he could put money on it, that he'd bet that you guys would be there mentally, fully, in game one of the playoffs. Is that something that's a permeates the locker room? Yeah, we ain't got no choice. Yeah, was, so we, we got to nip that in the butt for sure. Now, we're not, we not allowing that. You know, it's different if you win, if you lose, or off X's and O's or whatever. But, you know, teams just got 20 more shots on the glass. And that's rebounding. I only had one rebound tonight. Um, our guys, we just got to rebound. We got to play physical, more tough, and we got to get the job done. And we just got to nip that in the butt. We're going to have some tough practices, but we're going to be ready. Jalen, there's been a couple times this year where you, know, you guys obviously haven't had any long losing streaks, but you've had losses, and you've been the one to be like, hey, this isn't something to brush off. Is these last two games, is there anything you've seen that concerns you, or is it kind of the realization of where you're at, um, having clinched and knowing where you're at in the standings and all that type of stuff? Or are, are things you've seen that are like, all right, this has to be cleaned and up? Actual, and the only thing to say is we guys got to be ready when it's time to come in, in the playoffs, and we got to meet the challenge, you know, physically. You know, the game is a little different. They're not calling certain stuff, and it's weird or whatever, you know, but we can't make excuses on that, so we got to figure that out. Um, you can't let that take us out of the game. Um, you know, I got went back and forth with some rest. I thought it was some terrible calls in the first half, but I, you know, let that take me out the game a little bit, and we can't allow that to happen, and uh, we'll be better. Jalen, uh, you point out the rebounding. What can you guys do to be a better defensive rebounding team? Because it's kind of been a problem for a couple of weeks down in Atlanta. Offensive rebounds were a problem, second chance points. How do you kind of cut that down? You know, you got to emphasize it. You know, you just got to, it's, it's a fight. You know, if you just got to have a mentality like, you know, if I'm not going to get the ball, he's not going to get the ball. 
and it's a choice. And we kind of like expecting the ball to kind of bounce in our direction and other teams is just jumping over our backs and we kind of kind of watching and we got to we got to be better at that. And it just takes it's a mentality and, and we going we going to nip that in the bud. Jalen, when a guy like Brunson is, you know, just having open threes or getting to the rim, do you guys have to be more physical defensively? Is it kind of a knocking a guy in the ass mentality in terms of just exerting your will physically on defense? No, I just think we got to be connected. I think we were physical on the ball and we were doing our job. We just got to be fully connected. We got to trust that whatever coverage we're in, that we got to do our job in that coverage. And, 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 and that's it. And we weren't doing that tonight. Um, so we got to do a better job um, defensively of taking away team's strengths, teams, and, and making them play in their weaknesses. And uh, we got to be better at that. You know, tonight wasn't a great example. All right, we're almost at the finish line. Two more games. But let me sell it to you like this Sunday, we're full on celebration of Mike Gorman. I hope if you haven't had a chance to listen already, go back. I got to sit down with Mike. I think we did 43 minutes for 43 years. Um, he, he was quite kind with his time talking about from his, how he first dabbled in broadcasting to landing the Celtics job to all the craziness of a 43-year career and uh, how he's feeling about Sunday. And, you know, he'll, he'll tell you. It hasn't, hasn't really thought about how he's going to, he's going to, going to cap this all and what those what those last words he'll leave us with remember he is going to do the first round of the playoffs we got some of at least uh, a few of those games will be on our air um, hopefully all of them and uh, you know Mike will be along for that journey so Sunday we celebrate him Friday night before tip off against the Hornets we get a half an hour pregame show a half an hour before that we have a special scout got to sit down with Mike before we did our podcast um, I sat in for that, and that was uh, did some fun stories out of that as well. So I think you'll enjoy that. So uh, that's my pitch. Next two games, let's just let's just embrace the last two regular season games we get from Mike. Hearing him continue to be the the voice of Boston basketball, embrace that. We'll see if we get the uh, Grant Williams revenge game or Celtics encounter with the Speed Mahai Luke revenge game, and let's just see how that all tilts out. I'm not going to get worked up about the regular season. I'm not going to get worked up about this game against the Knicks. Like I said, I've just spent a whole bunch of time trying to blissfully ignore that and we'll work on the fringes. Regardless of how it plays out, we'll be here with you on the post game pod. So go like, subscribe, check us out on the YouTube page. Please, please, I, I, I don't ask a lot of you guys. Please go back and listen to that Mike Gorman pod. Um, if, it was, if it was half as interesting as I found it, um, I think you'll really enjoy it. And I'm really gracious for how much time he spent leading us through. And uh, believe me, I'm savoring, savoring every minute we got with Mike on the call. We'll catch you next time.